Microsoft has three new versions of Windows, and we might be seeing the ultimate Xbox handheld. Happy Friday, friends! It is a Friday, which is always a good thing. At least most of the time, it's usually a good thing, but whatever. It is Friday, we are in the middle of July, and I am not making this up. In th about a three-week time span or so, something like that, Microsoft has announced three different versions of Windows, and we need to dive in. So, kicking off the news this week, uh, Microsoft yesterday released a new build of Windows 11. You can download it now. It's for the insider stuff. And I will tell you that this has been the most probably unstable build of Windows 11 that I have installed. So, if you haven't updated to the one that was just released, you might want to hold off. It's not crazy unstable, and if you, if you do install it, you're not going to be that upset. But I've seen more crashes of file explorer and the right mouse click experience is a little bit slower microsoft made some minor ui changes that appear to have some negative effects on performance so just keep that in mind this is the the dev build i almost said the beta build so if you're uh if you're up in the air about that so just keep that in mind now on to new versions of windows that microsoft has announced so if, jumping in your time machine end of june microsoft said hey here's windows 11 and ta-da we've we've seen it we're now running it on insider stuff now, there is Windows 365 or Windows 365. This is a new service from Microsoft related to Windows. Now, this gets a little confusing if you've been hanging around the Windows world for a while because Windows 10, Windows 10, Windows 10 was billed as software as a service or Windows as a service. But let's be honest, it kind of really wasn't. I mean, it got serviced and updated really frequently, which is honestly a big mistake and something Microsoft is moving away from. But it wasn't a true service as we think of it when compared to say like Office 365 or something like that. Now, Windows 365 truly is a service because it's first off, it's only available to business customers. You can buy it as a business SKU or an enterprise SKU depending on your needs. And there's variable configurations of different types of VMs or, or virtual desktops. I shouldn't use VM, virtual desktops that you can configure. If that didn't give away a clue of what Windows 365 is, what it allows you to do is to run Windows in a browser. So you can fire up Edge or Chrome or whatever browser you're using. You log in and you have the full Windows experience in a browser. Now I haven't personally used this yet, so I can't comment on latency or anything else like that, but this is effectively what it is. Now, it kind of sounds like VDI or virtual desktop infrastructure, and I would say it, it's very similar. It's VDI-like. It's that type of an experience, but Microsoft is streamlining the operation where you just go and you pay one low monthly fee that we don't really know what it is. We saw one leaked image saying it was around $30 for a low-end SKU, but Microsoft is saying that there's going to be cheaper SKUs and more expensive SKUs, so we don't quite understand how much it's going to cost, but this is very much a corporate-level product where if you have low-end hardware or you need really secure infrastructure, this is the way to do it because all your data stays in the cloud. So the user can log into their, their uh, Windows 365 instance, which can be Windows 10 or 11, when Windows 11 becomes generally available later this year, use their line of business applications, but all that data stays in the Microsoft cloud. It never touches the end using your compute or computer, I should say, which is a very secure way of running an environment. I suspect that this is going to be very potentially popular in the enterprise space for the commercial or for the government side, like the DOD and that sort of thing. And I'm kind of wondering if this is related at all to their Jedi contract. That being said, that's the type of user for it. Now, the other versions of Windows that Microsoft has announced yesterday as well, they announced Windows version 21H2, which is for Windows 10. So there's a Windows 10 update coming this fall, and it's just called 21H2. There is not a lot new in this. There's a lot of just, it's really just sort of a stabilization build. If you liked the spring update, the 21H1, you're going to love 21H2 because there's not a lot new and it's just sort of stable. And that's kind of a leading indicator of wondering if this is how Microsoft is going to move forward with Windows because... Microsoft will be supporting and launching updates for Windows 10 and Windows 11 at the same time. I'm wondering, you know, sort of thinking out loud, if Windows 10 becomes the new long-term servicing channel or LTSC. We haven't heard what's going on with Windows 11 yet, and so that very well could be the case of where Microsoft is headed, is that we're just going to see these general just bug fixes for Windows and nothing new, no new features, no UI updates, which makes sense because all that stuff should be going to Windows 11, and Windows 10 just sort of sits there, twiddles its thumb, and if you like stable and non-changing environments, Windows 10 might be the OS where you're going to be hanging out for quite a long time. 
the reason why this is all speculation is Microsoft hasn't truly clarified what's happening with Windows 10. We know that there's a build coming this fall. We also know Windows 11 is launching this fall, but is there gonna be a build of Windows 10 in the spring? Is there gonna be a 22 H1? The reason why this is confusing is because Windows 11 will only be serviced once a year, but Windows 10 is technically on a two year servicing or twice a year servicing model. So there could be an update in the spring as well as one in the fall, unless Microsoft is going to truly update the servicing model for Windows 10 yet again. So this is all really confusing. And if you haven't been able to follow along, don't worry, you're not alone. It's, it's quite complex about what is happening with Windows because in a three week time span, we got Windows 11. And then a couple weeks later, we got Windows 365. And then a couple days later, we got Windows 10 21 H2. Three different versions of Windows all being announced in less than a month, and I can't see how this could go poorly for Microsoft with confusion. Now, this is what this is where I, I pat Microsoft on the back and say thanks for the job security because that's my job is to help explain this stuff. And once you peel back the layers of the onion, it makes a lot more sense. And here's how it boils down. If you have a new computer and you're a consumer, and as long as it's newer than seventh, if, it, if it's an eighth gen or newer processor, you're running Windows 11, that's where you're headed. If you have something prior to eighth gen, say seventh gen and earlier, you're probably running Windows 10. If you're an enterprise customer, you're probably running Windows 10. If you need a VDI-like experience, Windows 365 is probably for you. And if none of this makes sense, don't worry. We'll explain more as things go along. But the reality is Microsoft now has three versions of Windows actively being announced and it's it's fun. It's fun. So these things are, are hilarious in, the, in my small little brain. Uh, other things that are happening this week, Microsoft announced that they are acquiring Risk IQ, which is a security vendor which just has a ton of data and it's going to be integrated into Microsoft Security Solutions. It helps provide uh, better security through large data and sets and helps you understand what could be exposed on your environment. That is a very high level and glossy look at what they do, but Microsoft has announced they're acquiring. They didn't announce a price. Bloomberg was saying it was around $500 million. Which means, which is crazy to think that that's not a material figure for Microsoft, and so they don't have to disclose it, at least they haven't yet. I guess technically they could still disclose it in some of their filings, which will be coming up here. Well, this is a Q1, so it wouldn't be for a few months, actually. Um, we're, actually we're, we're all sitting here waiting for Microsoft to announce their fiscal year end earnings, which ended June 30th, typically probably maybe a week or so, maybe 10 days, something like that, until we get their final results, and we can understand how Microsoft performed during fiscal year 2021. Other things, uh, I got my dirty little mitts on Microsoft Teams 2.0. Now, Microsoft Teams 2.0 is the experience that Microsoft announced during the Windows 11 event, where this is just going to be baked in, or I should say really more attached to Windows 11. When you install Windows 11, this application will be installed by default. It's not currently available, but it did leak out onto the internet. Not a whole lot to report. It looks like it looks like Microsoft Teams, but this is the consumer side of it. The interesting thing is I thought there'd be some pretty big interoperability between Skype and this. Now, it, it didn't work yet, and maybe it's still coming. But for example, I sent Paul, a coworker of mine, a message on Teams 2.0, and I thought it would actually show up on Skype, but it did not. So he had to install the leaked build, and then we could chat uh, and converse through that. But I was surprised to actually see that there wasn't any Skype interoperability uh, through messaging yet. I for sure thought that was going to happen, but here we are. Look for that to launch. I would expect near sooner rather than later, Microsoft is going to be shipping this out of the box with Windows 11 in the fall. And if they want to get user feedback, they've got to be shipping it here in the nearish future. So I would expect it to arrive sooner rather than later. Um, on to the gaming news. There's been an interesting mix of gaming news this week, some from Microsoft, some from that. Uh, I think the big one here is the Valve's Steam Steam Deck. Now, I get I always want to call it the Stream Deck because that's what this little box thing that I use right here to do scene switching is a Stream Deck. But Valve has announced the Steam Deck, and it, it's based off of the Zen 2 uh, architecture from AMD, and it has RDNA, uh, I believe, 2.0 support. And so effectively, it starts at about $399 and scales up, and you can spend uh, you know, several hundred dollars more, I think around $650 or something like that. You can go look at all the specs. I, I want to just kind of break down a couple things about this. First off, Valve does not have a great history with building hardware. Not that it's not good hardware, I guess, just that it doesn't really perform well in the market. They, they launched that controller a long time ago. Uh, they also had these Steam boxes or for the living room and all this other stuff. And none of it has really caught on. And so now Steam is going all in on this handheld. So it effectively, if you're not familiar with it, it looks like a Switch, but it's a PC under it. So it's sort of in like in, in one way, it could be potentially the ultimate Xbox handheld. Everybody asks me all the time, like, is Microsoft going to build a handheld? And I keep saying, I don't think they're going to because it doesn't make a lot of sense. They want you to use your mobile phone with Xbox Cloud Gaming. And so why would they build hardware 
you know, here we are. Uh, anyway, so Steam is launching this thing. It's going to launch here fairly soon. I'm very curious to see how it actually plays out because it's a small screen. I believe it's a 720p resolution display. Battery life is going to be a big deal. Just how big and hefty is it? I mean, it's got some, it's got some pretty good specs on the inside. That being said, I'm still not completely convinced that just taking PC games and shoving them into a handheld makes a lot of sense because you have to consider the controller aspect. You have to consider the size of the text and everything else. And so I'm not trying to be negative. I'm just trying to be understanding of how is this thing going to play out in the market in the real world. I'll be super interested to see once people install Windows and then get Xbox game streaming up and running on it, which should be relatively easy to do. And it could be a very unique way to access that service. At the same time, I don't know if it's going to be much better than something using something like the Backbone, which is effectively creates the same model, except you're using the phone that you already own. Well, I'll be curious. I, I, I'm, I'm cautiously curious, I think, is the best way to describe how I am about this hardware. It makes sense from what Steam is trying to do. But at the same time, I don't know if it's going to make a lot of sense for everybody. For people who really want to play their PC games on the road, this is one way to do it. With a major caveat. Here's like here's where my mind runs with this stuff. Gaming laptops are a thing. This is, yes, more compact and less money than that. But at the same time, if you're really wanting to play that many PC games on the road while you're traveling, I think a gaming laptop might, might honestly be a better product for you. We'll see. We will see how this plays out. Um, Google is also making some announcements with Stadia. They're trying to make it more attractive for developers by lowering a, lowering a bunch of their fees. The really the thing that's backwards about this is, for one thing, Stadia has great technology. I really don't discount how well Stadia works with their controller, the whole integrated experience. The big caveat here is that they don't have the content or the first party IP and they've already abandoned those initiatives. Now they're lowering all these fees for Stadia. It would have made probably made a lot more sense if that's how they launched because Google needed to attract people. Google went in with the mentality of if we build it, they will come because we're going to have a ton of users because we're Google at the end of the day. And that, that narrative didn't really work out. Microsoft has learned that lesson many times that you can't just build it and they will come because your name is on it. That doesn't really work anymore. There has to be something attractive to it. And so Google is cutting their fees, trying to attract more developers. And we will see if this how this works for Google. There's a lot of, and I very much play into the memes that Google's gonna end up killing this, mostly because Google has a rich history of doing that with products, but we will see. I, I, the part of me really doesn't want Stadia to go away because more competition in the marketplace means Xbox and Sony have to be more aggressive with how they're building games and delivering them, which is a win for the consumer. But if Google can't compete, that's a tough sell. It's a tough sell at the end of the day. Also, uh, Phil Spencer, in an interview with The Guardian, talked about wanting to increase the Xbox early access program. Steam does this very well, and it's a really unique way for independent developers to get access to customer data and cash flow. One of the hardest things about building a game is that, hey, you've got to go to developers or venture cap effectively and say, hey, I need a lot of money, and I'm going to do nothing with it for three to four years, and then I'm going to launch this game and hope it works. And that's a tough sell because these games are either explosive, something like Among Us, which just takes off or it launches and just nobody plays it and so you're you know you're out of luck and you've you've lost all this money early access programs like we see on steam are a way for developers to get to a place let's just as an example they have one level done they can offer that up for just a few bucks and get cash flow coming in to help fund the remaining remaining of the development it's a really good way for early developers or indie developers i should say to get onboarded into the gaming world and start being able to build a sustainable studio now there's obviously risks for the people who buy in the game might not be finished the developers might go bankrupt there's always risk involved when you buy a game even the, a fully finished game look at people who bought cyberpunk as an example there's always risk involved when you put money into a game either as a developer or as a consumer but early access programs are a neat way for indie developers who who need the cash flow to survive to actually make a living with their product so on to the questions of the week always my favorite part all right bart says with Microsoft Teams 2.0 now out in the wild, do you know how it is being updated? Well, I need to be looking for new builds every time. I suspect it's going to be updated through the Microsoft Store is my is my uh, hunch here. And he also says, uh, Microsoft added the entertainment widget to, to the latest Windows 11 build, and it still seems committed to its movie and TV offering. Have you heard anything, any confirmation of this? Also, is this related to the luster of Xbox streaming stick? That I think you potentially maybe have hit the nail on the head that if Microsoft truly gets into this 
streaming market. This might be a lucrative way for them potentially to try to keep movies and TVs. I, I have not heard anything about what Microsoft is doing with it. That's just, I, I just haven't heard anything um, at the end of the day. And candidly, I still kind of recommend people that if you're going to be buying movies and TV content, I don't know if Microsoft is the best place to be doing that. Apple has a really good store that we know is going to be around for a long time. Even Google uh, has a store that we know is, again, going to be around for a long time. Uh, Ken says, does Windows 365 portend the end of the vicious upgrade your PC every three years cycle? Interesting. So what what he's referring to here is that effectively, especially with Windows 11, uh, we we hear IT space say, hey, every three years, we kind of refresh hardware, although some companies stretch it out to five, primarily because of performance improvements, uh, security updates, and these things just generally get beat up. You throw them in the hands of the end user, they carry it around in a laptop bag for five years, things happen. Now, how that can change is, if, it's, if you're replacing a device because the performance isn't great, what you could do is use Windows 365 and tap into the cloud and run everything through a browser and get truly impre- truly beneficial increases in performance. Now, you're going to be paying for that on a monthly basis, but that could be less than the cost of re, uh, buying new hardware for your operation. So it, I don't know if it's going to end the every year every three year cycle. I don't know if it's going to end that, but it's certainly going to give more options for IT shops around the globe to say, do we really need to replace this hardware? Because if the keyboard and screen are perfectly fine, then yeah, there's a very good conversation to be had that, hey, maybe this makes sense for our operation. Granted, it can get expensive too, if you're doing this at scale and all the licensings that would potentially need to be uh, required. Uh, Next question is the IT guy. Uh, less of a question, more of a thought. There are a lot of schools with legacy devices that don't meet the Windows 11 hardware requirements and can't afford to upgrade in time to Windows, uh, upgrading time for Windows 10 end of life. Google must be rubbing their hands, thinking about how many of them will move to Chromebooks instead. This is a very, this is the big challenge with Windows 11 and Microsoft's drawing this really interesting line in the sand that if you're not running this, then you can't, if you're not running an Intel as of as of today, if you're not running an Intel 8th gen or newer uh, processor, you're not running Windows 11. This is where that Windows 10 sort of funkiness comes in because Microsoft could perpetually support Windows 10 because Windows 11 and Windows 10 are so closely linked. Remember, when you install Windows 11 updates through the Insider program, it's just an upgrade. It's not an, a, a new build per se. It's just an experience pack, for lack of better terms, being put on top of it. So it's going to be easier, I think, for Microsoft to maintain Windows 10. And that's why I keep wondering if Windows 10 is going to become just this long-term servicing version of Windows, and it makes life easier for somebody in the school districts. But you're right, schools are very finicky on buying new hardware, and typically low cost is a demand. Uh, I mean, you're not going to outfit, uh, you know, fourth graders with an i an r9 from uh, r9 or r7 i can't even remember if there's r9 whatever until intel i7 or uh, whatever a beefy amd threadripper desktop or something like that uh so it's an it is a very interesting question and this is why this is the unknown that kind of drives me bonkers about microsoft i've asked them multiple times like what's going on with windows 10 and ltsc and how is this going to play out and they keep saying well we'll provide more details later and i keep waiting for later but we haven't heard it uh, Shark47, curious to hear your thoughts on right to repair. Microsoft's products have been notoriously hard to repair. Yeah, so there are definitely devices that are hard to repair. For example, this device right here, a Surface Book 3. I am very much pro in favor of right to repair. The the example that always comes out is the John Deere tractors, but I personally believe that you should be allowed to repair your device with products that you buy and not repl- not ruin a warranty because you changed the battery or upgraded the RAM or something like that. I'm very much in favor of right to repair. I think it's crazy that you cannot repair your own devices uh, without having to go through the manufacturer. I understand that there are implications in certain scenarios when it comes to security and other things like that, that they might look down upon that. But at the same time, I should be allowed to buy parts to fix my own stuff that I have already purchased. If you buy a laptop as an example you should own that laptop holistically regardless of whatever the manufacturer said you should be able to repair that laptop uh, to the best of your ability without having to worry about what the vendor is going to do or not do to you um so uh oh, programmer all says have you heard any rumors about a service duo 2 yes uh, and or the release date. I don't know if it's coming this fall. I, th- I think it actually might be coming this fall. And so uh, he says, my phone lost a fight with the pool and I'm on an old iPhone now. I'm debating on upgrading now or waiting a little longer for this year's batch of phone refreshes. If the Duo 2 has an improved camera, which I'm doubting, I'd love to upgrade that. 
it really depends on what you mean by improved camera. If you want, if you are hoping that the Surface Duo 2 will line up with the, what are we on, iPhone 12, if 12 or 13, whatever they're going to, I think I'll launch a 12S or 13 this year, whatever they're launching, it's not. Uh, I would not. I would not expect that. It will have significantly improved specs, I believe, from a chipset perspective over previous, over the first generation. But my best bet, if you're still waiting, if you're going to wait for the iPhone refresh, if you're going to wait for, uh, I, I don't know, what is Samsung doing? I thought they abandoned their, uh, oh gosh, their Note series for the fall and only moved to one release. Uh, but what I would wait until October-ish would probably be, be uh, in my opinion, a good time to reevaluate your phone usage needs. I'm honestly in the same category. I am using an iPhone 10s, which will be three years this uh, in the fall. And so I will be upgrading more than likely to an iPhone because we, we have iPhones in the house. And so that's what my wife uses and my family. But um, I will, again, be in that, that market. But at the same time, I'm not discounting that I might end up with an iPhone 12 if the updates that are announced this year just aren't worthwhile, candidly. Confused Geek says, cloud gaming versus Stadia. People who use both say Stadia is better. Have you tried and would you agree? I So Google has fantastic tech for their cloud stuff. I, I, it might be best in class. The problem, as I noted earlier in the podcast, isn't the, isn't the technology, it's the games. As of right now, and yes, I have tried both. This is the Stadia controller right here, is that the controller just connects natively uh, to your internet and doesn't go through another device and Microsoft needs to get on to that bandwagon and make their products just a little bit better and I suspect that they are uh, we'll see that here I, I don't know exactly when but I suspect we will eventually see that here soon and so how can Microsoft close that gap well give us controllers that connect directly to the internet and don't go through the computer stop letting I shouldn't say stop letting people but stop pushing Bluetooth Bluetooth is a, a bad latency uh, product for something like cloud gaming. Not that well, Bluetooth is kind of bad and it's frustrating. Hardwire your stuff, right? Anytime you can reduce a chance or potential chance for latency with this cloud gaming stuff, the better off you are absolutely going to be. Uh, BNCZ says, most of my tech enthusiast acquaintances are not impressed with Windows 11. Will they eventually come around and see the light? I, eventually, I think they'll eventually come around because Microsoft will just shove it out of their machine and they probably won't have a choice. I don't really know what's too impressive about it. Yes, it looks better. I, the sound profiles are significantly improved. It definitely feels more cohesive as an OS. I don't know if it's going to impress people or not. You're either, you got to remember, Microsoft has 30 years of Windows legacy or baggage. And so people know what Windows is. They, Mac OS is still, despite being roughly the same age, I mean, it's decades old at this point um it's still sort of that fresh candy kid on the block because they don't deal with legacy stuff and they move around all the time and so they don't worry about supporting laptops that are 10 years old in, in that regard and so in theory microsoft i guess doesn't worry about supporting laptops that are 10 years old this year either but uh, will they see the light i don't think windows 11 is going to magically make windows surpass like the expectations or impressionability of mac os by any means but i personally think it is a good and solid update from windows 10 uh having now used it for, for on just about every single machine that i own and rounding out the week mr pki closing with a fun question as always do you think people will be able to play the latest pc games in the cloud using windows 365 cloud pcs or will the target audience be only knowledge workers and developers well it's definitely knowledge workers and developers for now the high the problem is i haven't used it yet so i don't know how well or unwell or well or poorly the latency is with the the actual product microsoft is saying it works well for line of business applications gaming is a whole different kit and caboodle and so it if microsoft could make it work it would be super interesting because if you have the power of the cloud you know the cloud or whatever and effectively your gpu can be updated with just a couple of clicks for a reasonable monthly fee it might be interesting but for now microsoft is not pushing this it wouldn't surprise me potentially to see them try this out right they're already doing game streaming we know that they have the technology and maybe this is an interesting way that they eventually move gaming to their cloud for people on the pc but the problem is the narrative between, you know, just play, play Xbox Cloud Gaming in your browser. Or you can fire up this virtual desktop infrastructure and log in and play. And it's even better. I think the narrative around there is going to be a little bit confusing. And for now, they are just running with game streaming. So, wow, folks, that wraps it up. Awesome questions this week. Absolutely keeping me on my toes. Microsoft also keeping me on my toes with three iterations of Windows in three weeks. Uh, I can't imagine they're going to announce another version of Windows next week, but if they do, it will help me drink more uh, craft beer because that's what keeps me up at night. Just kidding. Anyways, as always, everybody, very much appreciate you coming to hang out. We'll catch you all right back here next time.